Dr. Reamer, I have two questions. One for Dr. Reamer. Uh, you mentioned that uh, probiotics, prebiotics reduce postprandial glucose. So postprandial after consuming what? What was the test meal, TS meals used? So typically those are oral glucose tolerance tests. So it's a, a glucose load that the uh, individuals, in, in our studies it's been 75 gram glucose. Uh, the study I presented for ours was a, a meal tolerance test. We have switched to oral You showed a, a meta-analysis. Yeah, in the meta-analysis, the postprandial was from oral glucose tolerance and meal tolerance. Both have been included in there. All right, in well, that's studies. rather different. But okay. And uh, Dr. Mel, that was an interesting uh, presentation about the, the kinetics. Uh, you showed that uh, the, chapati, the, the test products reduce glucose production presumably hepatic glucose production. Yes. So does this control. mean that more, the, so the glucose that's being absorbed is going into the liver, not appearing peripherally? Is that, so the, is more glucose going into um, the liver? That's possible. But that would, that would probably, oh, is that on? But in any, in any case, I, that would probably show up then in the disposal rates uh, as well, which we didn't see much, uh, much evidence uh, for that. Um, um, because I, I think your I think peripheral, that is that peripheral disposal? That's your only that's, capturing that's that gets into disposal. the periphery, is that right? That's to, no, that's total disposal, total disposal because there's a tracer of deuterated, uh, okay. of, of, uh, deuterated glucose. So that's total disposal. Okay, Fred. Yeah, Fred Brown. So I have a question to Raleen. Uh, in, in, in the beginning of your lecture, you referred to LPS and, uh, and, and uh, leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm not aware of any good data that prove that there is a leaky gut in diabetes. So I'm, I would like to know your comment on that. And uh, yeah, first that, I have one second point. So I think the, the leaky gut certainly has been shown in most clearly in rodent models in terms of uh, dietary challenge with a high fat, high sugar diet. So in an obese model is uh, where you see you give the high fat, high sugar diet, and the gut becomes leaky. And they've shown a decrease in the tight junction proteins and expression and whatnot. I know, I know yeah. but I refer to humans. In humans, uh, that evidence is, I I'm not sure that that's there yet. No, it, it has been established in yeah. the rodent model. The translation, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, one, one other point, and that's also a suggestion. Your title is on prebiotic, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. just as fiber, Prebiotic is not equal to prebiotic. There are many types of prebiotic, and major the, the data that you show were on oligofructose, and you, you show two studies, one with 21 gram a day and one with 16 gram a day, and effects on satiety. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of speculations on the fatty acids there that will have an effect feeding back on satiety. My feeling is that this is oligofructose. These are very big dosages. They cause a lot of gas production in the cecum. And we know that the extension of the cecum and also of the colon feeds back and reduces gastric emptying, has an effect on reducing appetite. And, and, and that's why I say, well, prebiotic oligofructose in this case, because we don't see that with slowly fermentable carbohydrates that are also prebiotic. And I would like to know your, 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 your feeling about it. So I, uh, my feeling is this is a gas, a gas production issue rather than a specific prebiotic type. So uh, I don't think there's uh, empirical data to, to look at Physiologically, is it the gas production uh, that is linking to the satiety? But certainly there is uh, some analysis we're working on in, in terms of the association between the two. So the reporting from the subjects of bloating uh, and flatulence and then correlations with satiety. And, and we do see an association between those two. So empirically, though, like, specific physiological data to, to tease that out, I'm, I'm not aware. It's well, associations are, at this they point. Are there. there are yeah. a, a whole range of studies with, uh, with uh, balloon inflation in, okay. the, in the colon. 
uh, that immediately show that this tension, like you have with gas, uh, reduces uh, gastric emptying and has an effect on the uh, on satiety feeling. So right. recommend you to look into that. Okay. Andreas Pfeiffer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. My, my uh, question is to David Mila. Um, I'm Dan Ramdath from Ag Canada. Um, my question pertains to the, um, the preparation of the, um, the chickpea flour, because we're finding that uh, the postprandial blood glucose response, um, and as well as the in vitro measurements of starch fractions, are largely dependent on uh, the way the, uh, the pulses are processed into flowers. Um, I, 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 mean, I could get that information. I don't know it off the top of my head, but in fact, of course, the incorporation of chickpea flour was only 15%, so it wasn't a majority uh, a chickpea flour. It wasn't a very high uh, component of chickpea flour in, the, in those products. Andreas Pfeiffer, no. So my first, I have two questions. One goes to David. Um, the hormone you didn't show was glucagon, and actually the incretin changes wouldn't really explain it. So I, do you say there is something I, X, or is it glucagon? I, I, you know, the conclusion, I, I'm glad you asked the question, because one of the points that we came to, and it was reinforced by this result, uh, was that glucagon is the hormone to be measuring. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't measure it in that study. Um, going forward, if we look at hormone panels, uh, I have well, we will be measuring it, and I would strongly recommend others measure it, particularly given this kind of a result. So completely uh, agree with you on that. And the uh, second question goes to Thomas. Um, you showed these changes in GIP and GLP-1 and glucagon. So do you explain the increase in glucose production by the glucagon alone, or would you say there is more? And what, are you, what roles do we attribute to the improvements to GIP and GLP-1? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, the, uh, our data will not um, give the best answer here because we have the, um, the, have the hyperinsulinemia and we have started to uh, calculate glucagon and insulin ratios and we, we have the feeling that the absolute glucagon concentrations do not, do not tell you a lot. But what I can say is that with isomaltolose, you have an um, increase of the insulin to glucagon ratio. And I think this is the most important reason why we see these effects on the glucose kinetics. And regarding the GLP-1, um, uh, there is another publication from MEDA from 2013 who also found an increase in GLP-1 in humans. It has been also done in rats. So, but we are, we are not happy with the data because we, we don't have the, found the right correlation of the GLP-1 to, to the hyperinsulinemia. Uh, we were actually uh, a little surprised that it was going up uh, at all. And also we think that uh, some of the risk, um, effects that we see are not hormone dependent. So, the, so we have some evidence that there are non-hormone dependent effects here. Jenny Brenmiller. Uh, Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. My questions for Dr. Meller. Um, we in Sydney, one of the bread manufacturers, very um, fair, very carefully developed a low GI white bread, and I know that it was based on guar gum. I don't know what the formulation was, but it had not, it had beautiful consistency, just like white bread. Um, you couldn't tell the difference by appearance. And so they put it into production and um, with the claim, clearly, that it was low GI to h help with marketing. But what happened in practice was that in the factory, the food technologists were found finding that the guar gum was so sticky in the equipment that it spoiled things. So what they decided to do was um, <coughs> leave out the guar gum till the last minute and add it at the final step in production. And then what happened in practice is that they forgot it. <laughs> okay? And so we found by testing on a regular basis that the GI had climbed back to 70. So best, best laid plans of mice and men. I, I think there's two things there. One, I think 
uh, and, and I think other people, we, certainly in industry, will uh, will probably be sympathetic to this point. The things that work are not edible in the fiber world, and things that are edible don't work. Um, that's a very gross generalization, but I think it is one of the challenges uh, to find things which are both consumer acceptable uh, and efficacious. In the case of the guar gum, it's a, it's, an, it's, it's a really nice story because actually the biggest problem was not this aroma, which probably could have dealt with, might have been a cost issue buying a different uh, a better refined guar gum or something. But in fact, it was the dough handling properties because this is a mix that people make at home. Uh, they have a very traditional way of making it. They judge when it's done sufficiently based on, on certain dough properties. Um, and consumers very quickly picked up from the dough handling that there was something uh, wrong uh, with the product. And, uh, and it wasn't acceptable with those high levels of viscous uh, fibers added at that point. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, we have time for two more questions or comments. Uh, first is Gabriel Riccardi. I have two questions. The first one, following up this subject with Dr. Mela, uh, we, we have some experience with viscose fiber, and our experience is that they, they, uh, working on viscosity is very much dependent on the size of the meat. So if you utilize a food uh, which is uh, based on viscose fiber, uh, in isolation, you get very good result. But when you include that in a, in a, in a middle, then the, the effect is going to, to be reduced. That was our experience, both with war, uh, war and also with glucomanna. So I, I wonder, did you test your product also within a middle? We haven't done that yet for this, but I completely agree with you that for all of these uh, kinds of innovations which are intended for a single product, which is a component of a larger meal, uh, it, is in, it is important to test them within a meal context. Um, and that is just good due diligence uh, to ensure that actually what you're promising is, is, is actually operating that way for the consumers. You anticipate that the effects will be uh, smaller. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it should still be apparent uh, in order to, to sustain a claim. So it's a good point, and I agree with you. And then I, <coughs> I have a question to, to Geoffrey. Uh, you, you presented very nice data, and, uh, and thank you for, for your presentation. There is one aspect which I think needs to be a little bit more clarified in relation to the impact of glycemic index in explaining uh, variability when you take into account other uh, healthy aspects of the food. Uh, I wonder, did you consider the frequency of consumption of different foods that you have evaluated? Because I understand that, I mean, you have, you have so many foods, but some of them are utilized from very few people and very small amount. And some instead, like for instance, legumes, can be utilized more frequently and can be uh, also utilized in larger quantities. Don't you think that you should take into account in your, into your correlation of the frequency of consume, consumption and the, the amount that is, so that you give the right weight to what happens in reality uh, in the population? I think that's a very good point. And the reason that it wasn't done was that it's going to take more time to do that and there's not been time to get around to doing it. Uh, whether it will show uh, something that's really important is difficult to say for sure. But it's very difficult to believe that uh, from the results that we've got, it's going to make a, a magnificent difference. I would suggest, if I'm going to predict at this stage, and I can only predict in, the, in a very poor way, um, that you're not going to get uh, more than 50% of either GI or GL explained. And for GL, I wouldn't have thought it was going to be more than 20%. And the last question or comment, David Jenkins. David Jenkins, Toronto. I really enjoyed the session and all the speakers. Um, but for Thomas and David, I want to have your opinion on the effect of uh, a fiber, a low glycemic index food, slow release carbohydrates on hepatic glucose output, because I think that's, that's something important uh, as opposed to disposal. How does one actually account for the second meal effect, which may be even given as a, an intravenous glucose tolerance and still one gets uh, a better uh, decay of glucose um, in that situation? Uh, well, uh, I'll give a quick answer, which is a slightly, un well, I won't say it's uninformed. It's informed by something which somebody said two days ago, um, which was the, uh, and I can't remember which speaker mentioned about a potential of direct effect of free fatty, uh, sorry, volatile fatty acids on hepatic glucose production. Now, that was something which was new for me, but the kind of timing of, of that effect 
and the fact that in, in, in both of our cases we're seeing these effects on hepatic uh, glucose production, that could work for me as an explanation. It's certainly a hypothesis, but I, I've, I, I'm, 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 I've not really seen the evidence for that, uh, other than and somebody said it, so I, I must believe it. <laughs> um, I, I, I I don't know if I have understood your question correctly, but I take it like this. You would like to know whether you can uh, use uh, methods like stable isotope methods or glucose kinetic flux methods in a more complicated setting like FIBA, uh, how you label the FIBA, FIBA whether you can uh, use um, well intravenous glucose tolerance tests. And I think this is very difficult. Um, if you do some ingestion with some labeled material and you add it with an intravenous glucose tolerance test, um, um, that will be difficult as a method if you combine this. Uh, I think that um, David's um, way to go for it is the best way. There's something, uh, um, probably there was some wheat uh, generation uh, in the, you named it the conditions, the conditions and of growing. And the 13 so you CO2. were able to yeah. increase this, uh, the carbon-13 yes. uh, um, enrichment. enrichment. Yeah. That is, I think, a very good way to go but it's also very complicated because you have to go for a lot of uh, uh, pre um, preliminary uh, experiments, actually, to find if your tracer-tri-C ratio is really <coughs> increasing in blood. Um, but I think this is a very good way to go if you want to transfer these, this model to a more complicated structure like FIBA or meals. And I think the methodology is not adequate at the moment. It has to be developed. And regarding the intravenous glucose tolerance test, um, it doesn't work so nicely in type 2 diabetes. You always have very high, very, uh, a very high variability here. It works better in, uh, in healthy persons, and only if you want to go for a good measure of insulin sensitivity. What it measures is peripheral insulin sensitivity, and not so much hepatic insulin sensitivity. So you need, if, if you want to go for the liver, if you're interested in the liver, and if you want to abrogate all the other organs like brain and pancreas and I don't know, uh, you must go really for uh, labeling products and then look what, the, what happens. And for the end, I would like to thank uh, all uh, presenters for their lecture and fru fruitful discussion. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.